to your host for the Lunchtime Discovery Series. The Lunchtime Discovery Series is a partnership collaboration. We work together really well with the Office of Environmental Education out of the Department of Environmental Quality. Many thanks to the folks in the Office of Environmental Education. Lisa and Marty, hi, I know you're watching. Hope that you're enjoying the show. Uh, thanks for working with us to put the show together every single week now. Um, before the museum closed, we were offering this program inside the museum every Wednesday at noon. Folks would grab their lunch, come and join us inside the Daily Planet, and we would meet guest experts, specialists in their fields across all topics of science, nature, environmental education, and talk about what they know, what we know, and how it all works together here in the state of North Carolina, and sometimes even beyond. And here in North Carolina, uh, especially in and around Raleigh and the Triangle, we're blessed, I would say, with just some of the most amazing people doing incredible, amazing work across all kinds of different topics. So every Wednesday, we would gather and just learn amazing new things. Well, now that the museum is closed, we have worked out a way to bring you that program again, and we're doing it all right here on YouTube. So you can subscribe to the museum's YouTube channel, click the bell to get notified, and then every time the museum's going live with new programming or uploading cool, you know, like museum sciencey stuff, you'll get notified, and then you can come right here and join us. You can also sign up for the Office of Environmental Education's Lunchtime Discovery newsletter, hit up their website in order to do that. And I'll try to drop a link to that in the chat in just a moment so that you can sign up and get notified when their programs are coming out every week as well. And you'll know who's coming up each week. As we go throughout the show, I'll let everybody know you can use the chat box here on YouTube in order to leave your questions, your comments, your thoughts, your experiences. And we'll be grabbing those and sharing those with today's guests as we go throughout the program. And then we'll have a long question and answer session at the end as well where you can share your thoughts and we'll pose all of those questions to our special guest. Now, that's a good opportunity to introduce today's guest. Today, we're gonna to be hearing from Jeremy Markovich. He's a digital manager, a writer, and a host of the podcast Away Message with Our State Magazine. Jeremy, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Glad you could be here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, how are things in your part of North Carolina? Um, well, they're sunny. Um, not too bad. Um, it, for those of you who don't know, uh, you know, uh, I work for Our State Magazine, and um, we are based in the Greensboro area. Um, people always tend to think that we're really, really close to where they are, but um, we're right in the middle of the state, so we can get everywhere really quickly. Um, and uh, yeah, they're 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 going really well. Um, so it, it's 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 great because it's you know one of the things that I want to talk about today is just you know it ends up being a, a pretty good time to be outside as much as you possibly can. Yeah, uh, you and I were chatting a little bit about that beforehand too, that going outside and being alone in the woods is one of the few things you can do and be really, really safe right now. Yeah, it's, you know, that that's, it's, it's funny. We, we were, uh, we were talking beforehand about this and, you know, I, I said that, you know, one of the things that I do uh, with some regularity is I go for a run every single morning and, um, that is of all of the things that have changed in our lives. Um, that is the one thing that hasn't changed is you can still walk out the door and be outside and be outdoors and, and walk around. Um, and, and, and largely, you know, in the woods and nature, uh, even through your neighborhood, just to discover things and, and largely the same way as, as people had done it before. Um, and, and so that, that's been a great thing. And, and just, you know, for, for some of you all who may, uh, not be familiar with the podcast, um, but you may know the magazine again, we're the, we're, uh, we're kind of the big magazine in North Carolina. Um, and, and we've been around for 87 years. Um, and so, uh, one of the great things is, you know, uh, you can teach an old dog new tricks. And one of the new tricks we decided to, uh, try was, was doing a podcast a couple years ago. And, um, I, I had worked in television for a long time before I came to our state and been writing for the magazine since 2011. And I had been working in local television. Um, I came on board full time in 2015 and did, I ended up doing a decent amount of sort of the adventure stories um, just because I was the guy that would do them. I was sitting across the room and they were like, how would you like to go um, and paddle the entire length of the Cape Fear River and take eight days to do it? And I said, well, that sounds 
sounds like something I could do. Um, and we did it. So, uh, so there's a lot of that, uh, that I, a lot of great experiences that I got to have. And, I, and, and my job, you know, sends me all over the state. And I'm not kidding you. I've been to every single corner through a ton of different communities, big and small, talking to just an amazing uh, breadth of people um, and, and really just learning stuff that, that, you know, just people will, will tell you, I mean, like the, the going, going somewhere and saying you're from our state magazine just opens so many doors. Um, and so as I was doing it, I thought to myself, well, you know, uh, some of these people that I'm interviewing and some of these places that I'm going to are just really fascinating. And, you know, the, the photography in the magazine is really, really special. The, uh, the, the writing is great. And, but I thought, well, what if we could actually hear some of these folks? Or what if, what if I could like actually try to take you somewhere um, and kind of put you in that situation, put you in that moment, no matter where I'm going or who I'm talking to. And so um, we happened to have a big fuzzy microphone um, that was laying around in the office. And I think it's under my desk here, but uh, you've got you to trust me on that. But we, ha we had one of those laying around and I said, I know how to use this thing. I think I'm just gonna, whenever I go out in the store, I'm just gonna bring it with me and talk to some folks. And, and so, um, three years ago, um, back in, in 2017, I did that and it became the first season of the podcast. And, and it was about, you know, I thought to myself, it'd be exciting to go to try to find some of the most remote places in North Carolina. Like actually, what does it take to go there? And what do you find when you get there? Like, who do you find when you show up in some of these places? Sometimes you don't find anybody because you're in the middle of the woods. Sometimes you go to a, an island, a Knott's Island in the, in the far, northeastern corner of the state um sometimes you do you, you you just you bump into people you don't and but part of the journey is is going there with somebody and and so that was the first season and so um i do have a few pictures from that which i'm going to to show and one of them is this one and i think uh i think you all can see it um so that is a very very green place uh that you're looking at right there um, I'm there, I'm wearing the, the UNC hat and I'm, uh, got a lot of rain gear on and I'm standing next to a guy named Dwayne Parton who came with me. And, um, this is, if you were, if you are wondering, um, I don't know if you could guess this or not, unless you've already seen the picture or heard the episode. Um, this is the most remote place in North Carolina. Like this is it. Like, so we went big on the first one. We're doing a podcast about remote places and, uh, we decided to go to the most remote place. Now, uh, this place, if you are wondering where it is, I'm not going to keep you in suspense. This is out in the Great Smoky Mountains. And the, the way that you figure out, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a very subjective thing trying to find the most remote place in North Carolina. But the way that you figure it out is um, there were some, some biologists from Florida. They did some calculations. And they said, you know, like places that are far away from roads tend to be very remote. Um, and so they said, what is the furthest point you can get away from? a road in the entire state of North Carolina. And this was it. This is out west of um, Bryson City. Um, it took us about a day and a half, about a day, uh, it was a two day trip. So it took us a, about that long to hike out there to get to this exact spot. And this is literally, I had, I had was, we, 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 we followed trails and we kind of knew the, the, the folks who, who calculated it also didn't necessarily give us the coordinates to it. So we had to calculate it ourselves and um, it's a GPS point, you know, so you pop it into a GPS device and um, the man who shot the picture, um, Andrew Kornilak, he's a fabulous photographer. He came with us to, to shoot some pictures. Um, he was supposed to bring the GPS and I had, I, at least I thought so. Like I, I had kind of mentioned to it offhand, like, Hey, like we were out there in the woods and I said, Hey, Andrew, uh, now's about the time I need you to get the GPS out. So you can, we can figure out where do we go off trail and, and, and go down, you know, to find a spot. He's like, what GPS? Um, so, so, you know, uh, our cell phones, which had not worked in any reasonable capacity um, for most of the day, because, you know, you don't get any cell phone service out there, um, you know, but you can pop in your GPS coordinates and it'll tell you where that is. So you can look at a blank Google map that will display you a red pin and we kind of had an idea of sort of about you walk down the trail this far and then it's about a quarter mile down a hill you know off trail to get to this spot and um that's what we did and so we 
we, we eventually found it, like the little blue uh, circle um, that shows where you are on Google Maps. We eventually made it touch the red dot, and that's how we got there. And the interesting thing to me about this was, you know, I had, I had kind of thought I'd had this experience where, you know, you don't know what you don't know what it's going to be like until you go there. You don't know what it's like, what the experience. You can say, oh, I, I think I think if I go to the most remote spot in North Carolina, I'm going to feel this way. I'm going to feel isolated. I'm going to feel, you know, a certain. I'm going to feel maybe alone. I'm going to feel, um, di- you know, more in touch with nature and disconnected from sort of everything else that we deal in our lives. And and when I got there, we just kind of got there, and 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 it was a, it was a spot in the woods. Like that's kind of what it was, but what we discovered was Dwayne, who's the, again the guy in the green on the right, um, you know, we learned just like who who is the kind of person that would drop everything on the middle of a week and just come with you to take you off trail into the woods, um, and learning his story and why he wanted to go with us and what the woods meant to him and 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 how he kind of changed his life around and and dedicated it to to, to stuff like this. I mean. It, that was the big surprise. That was the surprise that I did not realize or, or think was going to happen to me um, on this trip. So it ended up being a very different kind of journey. Um, and I will say, if you noticed um, that I look, I am like soaked. It rained the entire day um, that we went there. And I was like, well, you know, I'm going to have my rain, my North Face rain jacket. I'm going to have pants. I'm going to have, you know, everything. Uh, Dwayne was like, I'm just going to have a shirt and a hammock and some shorts and some chacos. And I'm going to go in the woods. And we were all kind of laughing at him. But he dried off quicker and was in better shape than anybody else than than me or Andrew were. So so he knew what was going on. Um, so that was one of the places that we went, and and it kind of went from there. I mean, I, I the other thing that I'll I'll show you here if I can get a picture of it up here in just a second is you know I actually had the opportunity to not just go into the woods but go to places that are hard to to get to or hard you know that are very remote um, and. One of them was the top of a television tower. This is in uh, this is in Gaston County. This is, and you're looking straight down. Uh, if you're wondering, um, those little triangles there—that's the obviously we're standing inside the tower. That's my foot there on the bottom, if you can see it. Um, and uh, this is about 1,500 between 1,500 and 1,800 feet up. Actually, I think it's maybe more about like 1,800 feet off the ground. Um, and if you're noticing at the top of the screen, so you see my foot at the bottom of the screen, uh, the top of the screen is the elevator that I rode up on this tower in. And, uh, what you have between you is a three foot gap, which is not hard to step across. Um, but it makes you think when you know that like, you know, it's a three, it's three foot across, but 1800 feet straight down. Um, now, and that was a weird experience too, because I'm not really afraid of heights, but you know, things change when you get 1800 feet up in the air. And, and it, you know, I thought, well, I'm going to be a little bit scared. I'm probably going to be a little bit nervous. I know I'm going up there. There's a lot of safety procedures. I mean, I have that little rope you see there is, is attached to a clip that's always attached to something. So if, you know, for some reason I would miss my step and I would fall, um, I would be, I would be okay. Um, but it really makes you think about that sort of thing. Um, but the thing that was strange to me about this was, the elevator went up so slowly. It took about 20 to 25 minutes for this thing to get all the way up that high. Um, the scenery doesn't change fast enough for you to really realize what's going on. It's not like it shoots you up there and you close your eyes and a minute later, you're that far off the ground. It changes so very gradually. And then when you get up there, it's just kind of strange. Like you're there and it's like, it doesn't feel real. It's not scary. It just feels like you're in a simulation in some ways. and. And so, if, you know, I mean, now, now people who, now my, my, my poor wife who, you know, was sitting at home and, and I texted her right after I got back down, you know, she was worried sick, um, but I really wasn't all that worried. And I think the other thing too was the gentleman that I went up there with um, is the guy that literally, I mean, I did this because I went like, well, who climbs a tower? Like who, who is the guy that changes the light bulbs on, those, on, on these big tall towers that you see all around? And I found the guy who did it and he's the one that, that brought me up. Um, and he was very calm. And, and you have to be, you would think that somebody that would do this job that would climb up this tower on a regular basis would be kind of nuts. And um, it's the opposite. I mean, he was the calmest, most rational, sort of easygoing person among that, I, that I've ever met. 
and and that's that's to him that's how you have to be if you do a job where you're up on one of these things all the time so so again it became there, that, that was another story that i had that i was really thinking like again i think i maybe sort of know what it might be like to climb up that high and and to do it and and uh, one last picture i'll show you just from the first season and then i'll, I'll i can move on and and i know if you have questions um i know i know chris is seeing them i'm, I'm not but um you know y'all feel free to interrupt me when you got a couple questions i'm rolling along because i could talk for a long time that's why i'm doing podcast so um the uh the last thing was um i'm i'm a bit of a map geek i love maps i just i've always loved maps and so one of the things that i was always curious about was what is the westernmost part of north carolina like like what like why why did north carolina get its shape and we did a whole series in the magazine about this, but also, you know, wh why is why does North Carolina stop where it does, and, and where does it go, and what's like what's it like to go out there? Um, now, if you're curious, the easternmost part of the state is in Rodanthe, so you can go there on vacation fairly easily, and a lot of people do. I mean, it's in the Outer Banks. There's, you know, there's the there's the surf, and there's places to rent, and it's you know, it's a stop off on your thing. Going to the westernmost part of the state is really tricky. Um, if only because it's so far out. And I don't think you really realize how, how long, how wide the state is until you try to go to the westernmost point. Because there's, this, there's a whole thing that people in this state have said for years is that uh, you know, this is a state that runs from Manio to Murphy. Um, what they ignore is that there is a half an hour of state left driving west of Murphy. You, get, you, still get, you still got a little time before you go out of Murphy and hit the Tennessee state line. And even from there, it takes a little bit of time to get from there to the actual westernmost point. So it took about five, six hours to get there from Greensboro. So if you were driving from the coast, it's, it's a whole day of driving to get to the westernmost point. And when I got there, um, I found, again, something kind of interesting. Um, now, this is, uh, this is me. This is back in 2017 out at the westernmost point in the state. And um, what, you, what I think you're seeing there is a rock. And the actual westernmost point, if you can see it behind me, is sort of where those barbed wire fences are meeting. There's a little, uh, you can kind of see it next to my green shorts, there's a little pink thing down there um, that actually marks the spot. And it's a little round disc. It's just like a little, like, you know, like a wayfinding disc that uh, surveyors would use. Um, the Rock is the guy who owns the land. Um, he was so proud of this. He had painted this rock and kind of shows you which way North Carolina is and which way Georgia is and which way Tennessee is and where because these three states meet at the exact same point. And, uh, and this is what I discovered when I went out there. First, I, I know it's way out there, but second, like there are like the, the people who own this land um, are Georgians. So the westernmost piece of property in North Carolina is technically owned by a couple of Georgians. Um, and they, they raise cattle out there um, and they've turned into a really weird tourist destination because as we all know like the internet has allowed for the pursuit of whatever whatever thing that you thought was kind of your weird fascination um for years and years like growing up again like i i love maps and my made my parents bought me road atlases when i was a kid and they and i had to do all that kind of stuff i'm like there's nobody else out there like me and it turns out no there's a ton of people out there just like you but you never could connect them before and there are a group of people out there that are like are interested in tri points and quad points, which is the places where three or four states meet. And they try to knock them off as like a checklist sort of thing. And so since the internet and these people have been able to find each other and know that their their kind of weird obsession isn't that weird to at least, you know, a good a couple dozen or hundreds or even maybe thousands of people, um, the folks that own this are now sort of running a, a, a kind of reluctantly have like a tourist attraction on their hands. And it doesn't happen, every, you know, a ton, but for a period there, once a week, somebody would show up at this guy's house, you know, on this piece of land that he's owned since 1951. He built his own house out there. Um, he's just kind of out in the middle of nowhere and people show up and they say, hey, can you take me to the, to, can you take me to the spot? And he, he does, and he's like, you know, you've seen what there is to see, and they show up and they take a picture like I do and they leave. And for him, he's just, I, I, think, I think he gets a little bit more of enjoyment out, out, of, uh, out of it. I know his wife was not uh, feeling the same way about that, but, um, but I think he got a little bit of enjoyment out of, of being a very minor um, geographical celebrity, if you want to call him that. Um, 
but you know, look at me, like, I'm overjoyed. I'm like, I finally made it to this place in the woods that I can see, like I can turn around and literally everybody in North Carolina is behind me. So, you know, that really excited me. And it's just, it goes to show you that again, like what you find in like these weird places is, you know, a little something inside yourself, but also like, again, there's a person who lives in this place and they, and they, they raise cows there and they've, they've, they're, they're kind of dealing with a weird thing that you don't think is a weird thing. And so um, that was, that was, you know, personally, I don't know if it was, you know, I, I don't know if that was an episode that connected with a ton of people, but it connected with me. That was a lot of fun to go out and do that. So, um, so, so, you know, the first season kind of came and went and we moved on to season two and three. And I know there's a question coming in from Chris. Well, yeah, before we, uh, run on to seasons two and three. We've yeah. got a season one question. Sure. Uh, Jerry is asking uh, where the remote spot is. He, he might be asking for GPS coordinates, which I don't know oh. if you can give out here. I don't. So, but, so uh, this is, yeah. The, the one of the things is that yeah, we had to figure it out on our own. And, and the thing that we had to figure out on our, the reason why is because um, the folks who, who did it, there's a, there's a, there's a, um, a husband and wife team out of Florida and they call it project remote. And if you want to, if, now the nice thing is they have on their website, they have, they've gone to a lot of these different places. In fact, the reason why I, I, I kind of thought about doing it is because they had done it maybe three, four years before I did. And they posted a video. They took their kid there um, who was in like the backpack and they were singing Baby Beluga on the way there. It was very cute. Um, but they had gone to a lot of these places and they figured out where they were and in some of the places they said, okay, we can, we can, you know, give out the coordinates if you really want to go there. In some places they had not. And the reason why is um, um, some of these places are on private property. They had to get permission before they go. Um, and in some places that were not on public property, um, you know, you have to sort of, if you tell somebody this is a thing, you sort of have to prepare the people who own the land um, to let them know that like, hey, we're going to say this is a thing that people might want to visit. Are you prepared for that? Some places were getting prepared. Some places were not. Um, the thing about the reason why Dwayne came with this is because um, now you can go into the national, you can go into the Great Smokies Mountains National Park. You can hike all around there. There's, there's miles and miles and miles of backcountry trails. And we follow them most of the way. But the actual spot is a quarter mile off of the trail. And guides, it's it's frowned upon. Now they, they, they cannot tell you not to go off a trail, but going off a trail in deep in that, that deep into the woods is not something you really want to take lightly. And it's a guide, a, a, you know, a licensed guide, a person who has a permit to take you out there is not going to do that. So that's kind of why we had to find Dwayne who was hanging around Bryson city, who was like, yeah, I'll go with you. Um, but if you were, you know, to answer your question, if you go to project remote, you can get a very good idea of where this place is. And, um, it is the, you know, the, the answer to the trivia question is the furthest you, away you can get from a road in North Carolina is five and a half miles, which is kind of staggering. If you think about it, you're never more than five and a half miles from a road, no matter where you go in North Carolina. In fact, in most places, you're much, 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 much closer. So we figured that out. And then from there, figured out the directions of how to go on the trail and about how far you, okay, you get to this junction, that's on the website. You go to this junction, you turn right, you go for about a mile and then after a mile you go off the ridge and you kind of go down the left hand side and it's in that area and when you line that up with a you know we before we went line that all up with, with the gps on like google maps and a couple other things and that's how we found it so um it's a long-winded answer to set way to say that um i don't have the coordinates i really can't give them to you um but it's a little bit of internet sleuthing you can kind of figure it out and and i will say again that yeah it's not a it's not that far of a trail but you know, if you get yourself lost and turned around out there, that's some serious stuff. So it's not something you want to attempt without just kind of on your loan or, or, or take it lightly. Um, Jerry says, thanks. For, yeah. Um, any more questions at the, at the moment? Well, yeah. Uh, my YouTube moderator actually has posted, does an 1800 foot tower sway? Yes, um, it does. Now, thankfully, the, one of the reasons why I wasn't scared um, is that... Um, it was not that windy that day. Um, but when you get 1800 feet off the ground, it, it, it's breezy. Um, you can see it when you look down, I don't know if there's a good shot here. I'm gonna try to bring it back up. When you look down the tower and you're looking at, um, you're looking down at like the, 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 the guy wires that kind of keep everything in place. Um, they're not like, they're kind of, they kind of bend. 
you can notice there's a bend in them. Um, and that thing is obviously meant to give a little bit. You don't want something so rigid that it doesn't blow in the wind. Um, but they're pretty well engineered. Now, you know, I wasn't dealing with rain. I wasn't dealing with a lot of heat. It was actually the perfect day to go up there. The only advice that I got was, you know, it was, I think it was maybe like 80 something degrees that day. It was a, it was a, you know, late spring, early summer day. It was like, bring a, a, a sweatshirt. And at first I was like, I wonder why that is. And he, well, it's just like, you know, there's a thermocline. It, it, the, the temperature, as you're going up, going up, it go, will drop. And so when we got up there, it wasn't cold, but it was a lot chillier than it was off the, on the ground. Because a lot of the heat that's radiating off the ground only goes up so, so much. So it was definitely cooler up there. Um, and I think the other thing about it too was I didn't feel it sway. And I, I felt, again, safe. But part of what... Um, part of what the uh, guy does, and I might be able to find a picture of this as we're talking here, part of what he does is he, he doesn't just kind of stay inside the, uh, inside the tower. He goes out on the outside of the tower and climbs up. And every once in a while, every once in a while, he has to go all the way to the top. And now going all the way to the top, um, I'm, I'm not kidding you, like it's to the very tip top of that thing. So um, I think I might be able to have it. I think I just pulled it up. Going all the way to the top, that is frightening to me. And so I would ask him, like, what is that like? What is it like to get to, get to the very tip top of this thing? And uh, here it is. That's what it looks like. Um, now, that's his <laughs> foot at the very top, about 2,000 feet off the ground. The elevator only goes about 1,800 something feet up. Um, now, there you can see the guy wires. Um, that are holding this thing in place. Um, so, you know, was I scared? I was not scared. Um, would I be scared if that was my foot holding there? They're looking straight down from 2000 feet up. Yeah, I would be definitely frightened. So, um, <laughs> so, so yeah, it's, it, it was, it was quite an experience, but I didn't get the full, uh, I didn't get the full, you know, tower swing, bad weather, climbing on the outside kind of experience. So. That's amazing that uh, my skin crawled when that picture <laughs> popped up <laughs> so yeah i think i think i'm in the same boat as you on that one um so um one of the and, and so you know that was all in season one we thought you know to me it was it was very i love it was a lot of fun to go to these places i mean people say you have a great job and i'm not i'm not gonna lie it's, it's pretty great um and but i thought for season two and season three i would kind of get into some more remote things that are not necessarily, you know, places you visit, not necessarily outdoors, but, um, you know, going to, um, you know, we found the, the, the North Carolina copy of the Bill of Rights is um, in the state archive. There's a vault in the basement of the state archive in Raleigh. And I thought to myself, you know, well, that seems like a hard place to get to. I mean, that kind of fits the definition of a remote. And so, so I went down there, I got access to that and learned the whole story, which of how that was stolen during the Civil War and uh, was missing from the state for more than 100 years. And it took an FBI sting operation to get it back. And um, which they had to get it back from a guy who was a regular on the Antiques Roadshow. Um, and it, it, it was a fascinating story and it was fascinating to me um, because you know it was one of those rare stories that everybody that had a part in getting it back, I was super excited to tell the story. I mean, from governors to literally the FBI agent who, who was undercover in the room talk to me for they were just so excited um you know i from there i mean i went all the way out to um uh, frying pan tower which is an old coast guard light station that is 32 miles off of the coast from wilmington and and one of the great things about going all the way out there is that technically you are you are outside of the united states out there you're so far out that you're like in the international waters um but you know it that was another one like a bucket list thing of mine and a lot of people that see this thing um, are really excited to go out there and, and check it out. And so for seasons two and season three, I really got to do a lot of that. And I thought, you know, this, this year, um, there was kind of one story that I had come across a lot over my time at our state that people had kind of talked a little bit about, um, or we'd done features on it in the past, um, but really kind of fascinating me, fascinated me. And it was the mountains to sea trail. Um, now, if you, if you do not know what the mountains to sea trail is, um, 
you were not alone, trust me. Um, you know, a lot of people, you know, you say, you know, I'm doing sort of the mountains of sea trail. And they go, what's that? Um, it is a 1,175 mile trail that runs the, the length of North, the width of North Carolina. It starts on Clingman's Dome at the very top of Clingman's Dome up on the Tennessee border, uh, which is the highest point on the trail. You start literally on, on the highest part of the trail. Uh, it runs downhill. I'm not all, not always downhill. Obviously, you go over mountains and around the Blue Ridge Parkway, and you wind for about 300, 400 miles through the mountains till you get to the foothills and then the Piedmont. And then the trail from there winds around. It goes through Elkin, um, through Pile of Mountain and Hanging Rock, goes around Greensboro, um, heads over to Durham, around Raleigh, um, and then dips into eastern North Carolina. And then once you get out there, you're in the Sand Hills. You're in a lot of um, uh, there's my dog, by the way, if you can see my dog back there, she's looking out the window. So um, there is, it dips down into the sand hills of North Carolina to the coastal plain. And then you hit the coast, you hit Surf City, and then you go up, hug the Outer Banks, and then you end um, at Jockey's Ridge State Park in Nags Head. And, and um, the, you end on top of whatever sand dune there at Jockey's Ridge happens to be the tallest that day. Um, so it's this very long trail, this very long thing that touches a ton of different communities all the way across uh, across the state. Um, it's very unique as far as trails go because, you know, the Appalachian Trail, which is a, obviously everybody knows about that, and, you know, thousands of people set up to hike it, hundreds of people complete it every single year. Um, that's that's kind of along the spine of, of the Appalachian Mountains. Like, it really runs, it's, it's kind of a, you hit a lot of different places, but it is, it can be sort of a singular experience. Um, Mountain Sea Trail is you hit the mountains, you hit the Piedmont, and then you hit the coast. You get all three of these things. The trail runs through and it kind of is routed through areas that don't necessarily, you don't necessarily think of when you think of a long distance hiking trail. And, and on top of that, there's an alternate route where you can kayak down the Noose River as well. And that counts as part of the trail. Um, so I had looked at doing something on the trail. I knew I wanted to do something much bigger about it. And the, 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 the idea that I hit on was, what if I could find some people who are going to hike the length of the trail? We're going to do the whole thing in one swoop. And so um, I contacted the folks at the Friends of the Mountains of Sea Trail, um, who were the ones that run um, sort of like if you Google Mountains of Sea Trail, their, their website comes up and they coordinate volunteers. They have interactive maps. They, have, they help out with trail guides. And they take a lot of questions from people who are calling in saying, like, I'm thinking about doing the whole thing. Like, I, where do I even start? So they were gracious enough to say, hey, uh, when people called, um, they said, hey, by the way, do you want to like maybe be part of a podcast with uh, some guy at, a, at, at Our State Magazine who wants to know about your every move? And, um, and so that's how it happened. So that's how I found kind of two groups of people that were heading down the trail. And, um, and so the way that I did it was I knew that I couldn't do the whole thing. Um, you know, doing the trail at the most, I mean, I think the record, you know, you could maybe, if you were to run it, um, there was an ultra runner who did it, I think in less than a month. And, um, and that is, you know, running every single day. Um, more likely it's going to take you two months, you know, between one, two, maybe three, depending on how fast you hike and what you see. So I didn't have that kind of time. I could not, not as much as I would have loved to have to set this up, just like I did on the Cape Fear River, that Cape Fear River trip going 200 miles down the river took eight days. This was going to take a lot longer. So what I did was, um, you know, everybody's got an iPhone. Everybody, you know, everybody's got some smartphone these days, it feels like. And so I said, okay, when you're in the woods, um, you know, I'll come find you at certain points. I'll be there when you leave. Um, when you come through this town or that town, um, I live in I live in Oak Ridge, North Carolina, which is just outside of Greensboro, and the trail actually runs down the side of the road at the top of my neighborhood here. So, uh, which I never knew until I started researching really what the trail was all about. And but when you come through, you know, my town, when you come through, you know, Elkin, North Carolina, uh, when you hit the coast, uh, maybe when you're about to get on the river, um, you know, I'll come find you, I'll come talk to you, and then I'll be there when you finish. And um, and in between just go ahead and record your thoughts, what you're coming across. And, and so they did. And so what I ended up having was this kind of this long narrative and a lot of audio hours and hours worth of audio. That's kind of real time taking you through what it is like to try to make your way across North Carolina on foot, you know, by, by paddling or by pedaling. And, um, 
and it was great and, and it's still in progress and i think um you know we are if you if you are following along and you're listening you you know that we we have we're about halfway through the eight, eight episode season we had we just had the fourth episode come out um the uh, the next one i am working on right now i'm in the process of writing it um and then i will start editing it um but there's about i would say 15 to 20 hours of audio um if not more than that um that we've gone through between what they've sent, what I have in interviews. And the picture that kind of emerges is that, you know, you have just the diversity across the state of this different landscape, but you also have, you know, when you kind of get off the highway and you decide to walk across North Carolina, um, you learn a lot about yourself. You learn a lot about these communities that you maybe have not gone to, or maybe wouldn't go through again, just because they're off the beaten path. Um, you learn what it's like to be somebody on foot or on bike or on, you know, in a kayak in a world that's built for cars. And you kind of learn like really, you know, what, what it's like to get, to make that kind of a journey, um, to do something that not a whole lot of people have done. I mean, again, hundreds of people do the Appalachian Trail every single year. They finish it every single year. The total number of people that have finished, um, at last count, the Mountains of Sea Trail, um, since 1997, when it was first through hike, is 112. So it is a very, if you have finished it, you are part of a very small and select group. And your story really hasn't been out there um, that much in ways that it has maybe for other trails. I mean, you can read a ton of stuff about people that have finished the AT. So, so that was all very exciting to me. It felt like all new territory. And you learn about, you know, the problems of like, why, why isn't there more trail? Like, about 700 something miles of trail are actually trail. 400 miles of the route follow roadsides. And you might wonder, well, you, you know, okay, well the trails, you know, what, what, how hard could it possibly be to go out there in the woods and build a new trail? And the answer is it's extremely hard. It can take years and it takes the, just people who are super dedicated to it that expect really nothing in return to do all this. Um, and so when you start poking around in these little towns the trail runs through, you meet the people who actually hike it. You meet the people that they meet along the way and you just follow their journey. Um, you get this interesting picture of North Carolina as a whole um, that is not just about nature, but also about kind of how we work and, and, and the makeup of the people who live here. And, and, and if, you know, if nothing else, like, you know, pardon me when I started, I was just like, I wonder if they're going to finish. I mean, that's, that's the thing to me. It's like, you know, you set out trying to walk almost 1200 miles across North Carolina. Like, are, are you, are you going to make it? Like, can you, can you do it? Like what happened? Like what happens when things go wrong? Um, so all of that has been, it's been a lot of fun to do. And I think, um, you know, one other note about this too, is that um, if you're listening, um, when I recorded all this, so I knew I was going to have sit on this for a while um, just because I wanted it to kind of come out with hiking season and sort of maybe have it coincide with when they were actually on the trail. So I recorded this starting in May of 2019. So what you're hearing right now is a trip that started a year ago. And, um, you know, when we, we, we started to launch it, we, we, we launched it, um, you know, in April. Uh, it's a very different world than it is, was in 2019. It's a little bit of a strange little time capsule. I mean, um, it's amazing to see, you know, you know, I was just walking alongside of them, you know, and it, it's, a, it's such a weird experience to think about you know, to go out into the woods or to, to stand next to somebody and just have a conversation, you know, with no mask on. Um, a year ago, like, that's nothing. And now you think about every little move that you make, and you think a lot about the people that you encounter, and the places that you can go, and, and the time that maybe you have on your hands. And it's, it's a lot different. And I think, you know, the interesting thing is so far, um, you know, we'll deal with that in the episodes, I think, to look at because it's, it's, you can't not look back at the way that things were versus the way that things are. Um, but it's a strange little time capsule um, to even look back a year and say, you know, I don't know how much different this trip would be. I mean, at one point, the MST was, was advising people, you know, parts of state parks were closed. And the MST was saying, you know, if you're, if you're through hiking right now, maybe you should stop. Maybe you should take a break for a second. Um, you know, because these folks that are, are, you know, they're out there, they're trail angels, the people that are very selfless and will say, you know, you get to a point where there's no campsite and you need a ride into town, you know, and they, they agree to have their number and the name and number on the MST website. Um, you know, 
is it safe to call those people now? You know, I mean, is, is it safe for you? Is it safe for them? Um, those are all things that never, I mean, you would never even think about before. It's, it's an added wrinkle um, that now when you think about now, you don't have to think about, you know, it's, it's, it's a way different calculation. Um, and so I think, you know, like the more kind of when you get toward the end, you, there, are, there are ways to think about that. But the other thing is like, it really is interesting to me. I mean, like I'm gonna show one more picture here um, from the trip and, um, you know, going to it, I mean, like one of the, one of the folks that, uh, the two folks I'm about to show you here, um, uh, this is, this is a, it, it, you probably know this if you've been out in Western North Carolina. Um, you know, I can't see your chat, but I'm sure you're probably like, oh, I know where that is. Um, it's Clingman's Dome. Uh, and it's the top of Clingman's Dome. And, um, you know, that's the observation tower behind you at the very tip top. So you can see out the Smokies. Um, and then, uh, those are the two people that I'm, that started the hike. And that's, um, there's me, I got the UNC hat again. Um, I really dressed up for the occasion. Um, and, uh, and next to me, that is, um, her name is Erin Brennan, and that is Thomas Weinheimer that is next to her. And they left as part of Warrior Expeditions. Um, and it, it, it was fascinating because there, there's another couple that you, if you've listened to so far, you've heard from um, Aaron and Lexi Harris. And they are from Tennessee, but they have family in North Carolina. And they, they were in a very different part of their lives. They were newlyweds. They had been married for less than a year. And they were going out to hike because they thought that, like, you know, like they were between jobs. They're going to move. Like, it'd be kind of cool to do that. They always want to do a long distance hike. This one was manageable and they could do it. And they had kind of prepared, but they were just kind of like, well, you know, we're just going to freelance it. We're just going to, we're just going to go and see what happens. And they were very, you know, listening to them, they're just funny and interesting and like, and just kind of very warm hearted. And, and it kind of put their relationship into a different gear. I mean, like you get married to somebody, but then, you know, even when you get married, you don't spend 24 hours a day with your spouse and maybe what is a high stress situation sometimes, um, you, you know, and so that was something that they had to deal with. And, and it kind of, it, it changed their relationship, I think, and made it maybe more, made it stronger. Um, but Aaron and Thomas came from a different background. Aaron had literally just gotten out of the army a week before she started her hike. And, you know, she had been to Afghanistan. Thomas, Thomas had been out a little bit while longer. Um, but Warrior Expeditions kind of was meant to simulate what it is like to walk home from war. I mean, there was a time when, you know, if you were a soldier, you would come out of the battlefield, but then you had to walk home and you would talk to your fellow soldiers and that would give you time to decompress and kind of process what you've gone through. And, and, and it was not, it was like a gradual reintegration back into society. Today, that is not the case. I mean, you can literally be, you know, on the battlefield one day and maybe 72 hours later, you're sitting at your house at home back in this country. And that is really jarring. And I think, you know, what what the, this group warrior expeditions is trying to do is say, you know, we're going to give you a chance to go out and kind of work some stuff out in nature, in the woods, you know, where you don't, you're not, you're not running right away out to go find a job to try to figure out how do you, how do you kind of change up your, what your, you know, what was once important to you, what mattered to you, what was a matter of life and death being in the military to, well, now you got to find a job and now you have a boss and the boss is telling you to get something done. Um, you know, or what's your sense of mission? What's your sense of purpose? And it's not meant to solve all the problems, but it's definitely meant to be an experience that really maybe kickstarts something in your mind and allows you to kind of spread out a little bit more. And so, you know, again, the story is about a trail. The story ultimately is about this 1,175 mile footpath that runs across North Carolina, but it's about the people and it's about people and the journey they go through. And um, I was just lucky that I got to tag along um, from time to time and kind of hear their thoughts and, and be there when they started. And and be there along the journey. So um, that is coming out right now. And um, I, 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 again, sometimes I got to pinch myself. That's like, this is what I get to do. Um, I get to tell these kind of stories and it's wonderful and it's great. And um, I'm always still taking requests for places to go. I get them all the time. Um, and uh, I know uh, you probably got some places that are like very, uh, I have egregiously missed that obviously I should have gone to by now and I have not. Um, and so, I mean, I love it when people yell at me, um, in that way. Um, so you can, you know, if you've got, if you've got an idea or a place I should go or a place to check out, like I am all ears and I love to hear it. And, um, that's part of the fun. Jeremy, thank you. Yeah, no problem at all. And, uh, you know, again, I'm happy to answer any more questions y'all might have. That's excellent stuff. I, I can't imagine how many great stories you've got. 
just from all over. Uh, a, a good question that came in a little bit earlier. What's the strangest thing you've eaten on the road? I eat a lot of Bojangles. Um, I'm just a, <laughs> I'm just a fan of Bojangles. I just like it. And I don't like, I don't eat a lot of fast food normally. Um, you know, I mean, there's the nice thing is I, I think it like, no matter where you go in a lot of places, I mean, if you go in the woods, you're eating your backpacker food, it's freeze dried and it's, you know, it is what it is. Um, uh, but in a lot of places you go, I mean, it, the hospitality still kind of is always there, no matter if you're in a, you know, in a big city or if you are in a place that you might consider to be the middle of nowhere. Um, and so people, you know, are really, and they've, they've, you know, I've been in places where people have invited me into their home and served me a meal and, and it's been just as good, if not better than the place I would have gone out to eat. So um, the weirdest food, I got to think about that for, if something shakes loose, I will, I will definitely respond to that um but i just know like i'm just you know i like to stop and enjoy things but also like when i'm on the road i just kind of want to i'm just so excited to get to where i'm going that i really am just going to hit the bojangles drive through i'm going to get the bow box i'm going to eat it as i keep on going just so i can get there before just so i can get there so grab that bow box yeah. bojangles did not pay us they did not for you to say that yeah oh well i don't know but maybe they advertise in our state and i don't know <laughs> Uh, let's see. Jerry and Kelly both said, yay, Bojangles. All right. Yeah. Good, good road food for all our nature lovers yeah. out there. Uh -huh. That's a good way to carb load, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit about finding stories, right? Like I can imagine you go out and you're talking to people and they're sharing their experiences or telling you about this place or, you know, a landowner takes you to the big rock that he's painted, but actually pulling out the the story the like nugget that's within that that sort of speaks to broader human nature or universal truths those sorts of things right the things that make us uh learn from enjoy and engage with these stories on a sort of a deeper level how do you go about finding that piece you know it's interesting because i think there's no that, that's the one question that we get at the magazine and and, and for the podcast as a whole is like, how do you come up with this stuff? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the one thing is like, you always have to have your ears open. I think you always have to be finding, there's always something, I mean, the one, the one skill that you kind of get from doing this for this long is like, somebody says something and like, you know, like, like a, like an alarm goes off and you're like, Whoa, what, what was that? Like, tell me that again. Or, or, you know, or you just or get curious about something and you can't let it go. And, and so I think it's a mix of, of different things. And I'll, 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 I'll give you a couple examples of how different stories came together. And then I'll tell you about the one that just kind of was the most random thing, but led me on this weird, weird journey was, um, you know, the bill of rights story. Um, somebody said, you've got to do that story. Um, as a buddy of mine, he's like, do you know about this? And I was like, I don't, I don't know the details. I think I heard about it, but I didn't know the details. And he told me, I'm like, well, that's crazy. I got to do that story. Um, you know, a lot of times you'll be out on one story and somebody would say like, well, you know, the story you really got to do is this. And then you're like, oh, I do have to do that. That is, you're definitely right. Um, you get assigned one story and you come out of it with like three other stories that you got to do. Um, you know, I mean, in, in, you know, some of them were just really good stories that came out of the magazine that we had done before, but it kind of maybe put a fresh uh, set of eyes on and, um, and, and gone out and, and, and kind of gotten the update. And the one story I think that I feel like was the most you know, sometimes you just pull it a thread. And a lot of times, you know, the, 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 the secret about, you know, doing anything like this is like, you pull a lot of threads that don't go anywhere. So you get really curious about something and you're like, this is going to be great. This is going to be amazing. And then you kind of pull the thread and then like, there's nothing on the other end. And you're like, okay, that didn't work. And you do a lot of that. You kind of, sometimes you think something's going to be great and it's not. Um, so, you know, I had been doing, um, I think I had been curious about the westernmost point in the States, like, as, I, as I said, which is something that was, was a piece of fascination for me. And I was just going, doing a bunch of research and I went on the Washington Post website and they had this thing about these tri-pointers, these people that like to go to the, you know, the, the points where three states meet. And I did the thing that you really, really should never do um, if you're on the internet, which is I read the comments on that story. And somebody said in the comments, what would happen just hypothetically if I stood on one side of the state line and there was somebody else standing on the other side of the state line and I shot that person, um, what would happen? Like, where would the crime have been committed? Could they arrest me? Could they bring me in for, you know, like, like what, like what would happen? You know, like it's a hypothetical situation. 
And the very next comment was, hey, um, that's not actually a hypothetical situation. That actually happened on the North Carolina-Tennessee border back in 1892. Um, and here's, and here's, and so I was like, well, I got to look into that because I've never heard that. It sounds like the craziest thing I've ever had heard. And, and so I kind of started looking into that. Turns out there was a, there was not one, but two North Carolina Supreme Court cases um, that dealt with this about what happens. And so, so you have legally what happens there. And then I got interested, well, well, like, but like, you know, you read a Supreme Court case, sometimes they're a little bit um, disconnected from reality because um, they're more interested maybe in the legal ramifications about, you know, the very high level, you know, patchwork of laws and how they all fit together. And I was like, well, who, who, like, who actually pulled the trigger? Like, who got shot here? Like, what happened? And there wasn't as much information on that. So the, the fun part is, and uh, this is a great part about living in, in, in North Carolina, um, is that I called up the state archives and I said, what do you have on these two Supreme Court cases? And they said, we have like the files from those cases. Like, like no joke, we have the original files. And so I drove to Raleigh, I went upstairs, um, went to the state archives. Um, fun fact, you are not allowed to bring a pen in there um, because they do not want you marking up their precious documents with a pen um, or anything like that. Um, and they brought out two boxes and they were literally the original handwritten files um, and transcripts and notes from that court case. And all the people who testified about what happened and why it happened and why this guy pulled out a gun and shot this other guy on the other side of the border. And so that was just fascinating to me, you know, and, and, and he, now at th this point, I had been working on the story for months and I was like, I think I've got it, but I'm still like, he still doesn't tell me like who this person is. And if this person, like what happened to him after the case, you know, after the case is over, once you're kind of done with the legal system, you kind of drop off the radar. And I poked around on Ancestry and like, you know, these kind of these genealogy websites and was able to track down the grandson of the guy who pulled the trigger. And I tried and tried, I couldn't get in touch with him. You know, for some reason, some re somehow I discovered that he was a, he lived in Tampa, Florida and that he, he played music every once in a while at an ice cream shop. So I called the ice cream shop and I'm like, you don't know me, um, but I'm calling from North Carolina. There's a guy named Eddie Hall who plays there every once in a while. The next time he comes in, tell him that I called, maybe that he should call me back. And I'm like, there's no way it's going to happen. And I was just standing on the driveway one day and he calls me. Um, and I said, Hey, did you know this whole thing about your family? I'm so excited to talk about, talk to you about this. I am so excited to tell, you know, it's like to hear about your family history, because this is just a crazy story that I came across. So do you know this guy? And he's like, I have never heard of this person before in my life. I do not know who this, this guy that, you know, this, uh, William Hall, I have never heard of him. And, uh, Oh, I did not turn that off. Um, I have never heard of him. Um, and so I'm like, my, my stomach just dropped. I'm like, they got the wrong guy. Or I just hit another dead end. I've hit, you know, you hit so many. I drove all the way out to the place where it happened out in, out north of Murphy in Cherokee County. And I was just like, hit so many dead, dead ends. I felt like I, I, if only I could get to this part, um, I could figure it out. And he says, well, you know, but though, but like my, you know, my daughter lives in St. Louis and, uh, She's got all kinds of genealogy stuff in her basement. She probably has it. So I call her up and she went into the basement and literally I was on the phone with her as she went into the basement and opened up these books that her, grand, that, that her relative had put together on the entire family history. And like, it was just a fascinating thing to go with her as she's discovering all of this information about this. She had never cracked these books up before. She just gotten them from her aunt and they just sat in the basement. I mean, like how often do you look at your family history or, or really look back at your old photo albums? And she just was like dawning on her, like that there's this fascinating part of her family history that's being revealed to her by some random guy in North Carolina that called her on the phone one day and, and made that human connection um, and got to the bottom of like this relative and learned that he was a real person that like, I mean, and, and learned that he, you know, there's a picture of him standing out in front of a barber shop that he, that he ran and a picture of him you know, that never would have come to light, but it would have been hidden in this, in this woman's basement for, you know, a long decades and decades and decades. And, and 
to be able to get at that kind of a story, you know, I, I'm lucky in that like that doesn't come around very often. And I think just kind of when you pull on it and pull on it and pull on it, just when you think you're done, just when you thought you've gotten everything you're gonna get, um, you find something really, really remarkable. And it just ended up being this, you know, I mean, there's there's nothing like just experiencing something with another person that they that nobody knows what's gonna come next. You know, nobody knows what, what it's gonna be like when they open that book in the basement and learn about this long lost relative. Um, that did this and um that ended up being um a, a episode in the, in the second season called you know called how to get away with murder in eight in 1892 um and um it was just i don't know that that you know that maybe is not the one that got the most you know listeners whatever but to me that was just immensely satisfying I mean, that those that's one of the reasons why you do this is to to come across places like that and to meet people like that and to be able just to have the privilege of being able to tell stories like that. That's amazing. That's such a cool story. Okay. Uh, well, we had, we had a couple more come in. Uh, yeah. Thomas wants to know about any haunted or interesting folklore sites on the MST. You know, uh, off the top of my head, I don't know of any haunted sites. Um, on the MST. Um, the interesting thing about the MST is that it runs, so it runs across like the top of Mount Mitchell, for example, um, runs around Pilot Mountain, that sort of thing. And um, the interesting thing that I, I think like, it's part of the episode that I'm working on right now is that um, you can get to, you can get to different parts of the state. Like if you're hiking and you're gonna do the whole thing, um, and a lot of people just hike sections of it, but like if you wanna do the whole thing, um, and you're on foot and you're like, well, there's something kind of cool that I can go see, but I got to take a half mile off the trail to go see it. Um, at some point you're like, I, I just got to keep going, man. Like I got, I got I to get to the end. Like I got two months ahead of me. I got to get there. Um, and um, what Erin did was she, you know, at some point they switched over to a bike and that broadened her range and got her to a bunch of different places. Um, nobody mentioned anything that was haunted, um, but there are two different stories I've done that have, about places that are, that have been haunted. Um, and one was um, this town called Littleton, North Carolina, which has a Bigfoot museum. And when I go to town there, um, you know, there's this house this guy moved into, it turned out to be haunted. Then he started getting, you know, if, you, if you're the dude who owns the haunted house in town, people kind of come to you with all the weird stuff that they have. Like, like oh, by the way, um, you know about ghosts. I think I saw Bigfoot. And so, so he became that guy that lived in a haunted house that also became a Bigfoot expert expert in this, in this, you know, tiny little place that's up north of uh, Raleigh up near the Virginia line. And um, we did another story about this place called Davis Island, where um, one of our, uh, I work with a, a producer named James, who's phenomenal. And um, this little island with a house on the end of it um, that sits out um, in the sound just uh, near Marshallburg, North Carolina, way out there on the coast. And this house was built so long ago that it used to sit at the end of a peninsula. Then a, you know, in the years just before 1900, um, a hurricane came through and cut a channel. And so suddenly this house that was on a uh, peninsula is now on an island. And, um, but it had been there forever. It's still there. Uh, we talked to the guy who owned it, who lived out there on it for a long time by himself. And, um, you know, we're, James is out there and he hears all this creaking and it, all this noises and all this settling and things are moving and, and like he's like what's going on he's like eh, that's the ghost so um so it's amazing to me like when in littleton apparently there's just people that know about the ghosts and they just kind of throw it around like it's just like it's old news by now um but when you show up and you're like i'm sorry what like ghosts so um those are two places that that we got to run into a little bit of the supernatural Nice, nice. All right, uh, let's see. We've we're almost out of time, but I'll see if I can get through the ones that I still see here. Yeah, I'll go rapid fire. We'll hit them all. Yeah, well, folks are interested in about uh, what you're reading. They see the bookshelf behind you, in particular, the elephant in the room. Yeah. And so they're they're curious about the what you're taking in. Yeah, I was gonna say that, that that's the new thing, right? Is like when you're like giving media interviews and you have to set your bookshelf up behind you. Um, mm -hmm. So you have to you have the nice stuff out there. You know, I, I, I Cheryl Strayed Wild um, is something that I've read. Um, Elephant in the Room is written by a friend of mine named Tommy Tomlinson about um, his journey in weight loss, and it's a great book. Um, you know, I just kind of finished up two stories, um, two books about one is called The Relic Master, um, and one is called The Richest Man in the World. One's a one's a novel, one's a one's a nonfiction. 
and uh, dealing with the Holy Roman Empire and um, the way things that used to be. Um, it, it's, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's quite the story. It is a very big departure from uh, a lot that's going on right now. But um, those are two things that I just finished. And uh, uh, I'm on to the next one. It's, uh, I have two kids and um, you really got to make the commitment to read, but uh, it can be done. All right, there's a suggestion here to visit uh, and investigate the location of the grave of Blackbeard's sister in eastern North Carolina. Hmm. Okay, I'm on that. I've heard a lot about Blackbeard. I have not heard about the grave of Blackbeard's sister, so I am I am going to check that out. There you go. And Angela's asking about the Devil's Tramping Ground. In uh, Chatham County, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, that That is one um, we've, you know, like, it's amazing to me again like these are things that like you're like well surely you've gone to you've done like more than 30 episodes you've gone there right and i'm like i haven't and then people are like what do you mean you haven't done that yet like it's so obvious <laughs> um it is on the list i know i know there's some weird stuff that happens out there um obviously uh i just have not had the time or the uh <laughs> i haven't worked out the gumption to go out there and camp at that and, 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 and stomp around there at that, at that point but it's it's there it is on i have a big I have a big long list. I'm going to add Blackbeard's sister's grave to it. And trust me, the devil stomping ground is already on it. There you go. Well, for when those episodes come out, tell us how people can find Away Message, the podcast. Uh, so it's really easy. Um, you can go to ourstate.com slash podcast. Um, if you have, you know, there's a million different podcasting uh, apps now. There's Apple Podcasts, there's Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts. Um, if you do a search for Away Message, um, we're it. We're the only one. We're the, we're, that's it. So um, it is free to download. Um, you can find it a lot of different places. If you haven't listened before, you got a big back catalog of stuff to listen to. And we're, we'll be releasing new episodes, hopefully every couple of weeks now until, uh, you know, end of summer. And, um, and it's a blast. So yeah, that's the easiest way to find it is just to search for a way message, wherever you get your podcast. And you'll see, you know, you'll see the, you'll see the little logo, our states on the bottom, there's a dude that's hiking um we made the logo look sort of like the mountains of trees the mountains to sea trail signs uh for this season so um that's a that's a dead giveaway but that's the easiest way to do it and you can subscribe and and off you go all right there you have it everybody jeremy thank you so much for doing this today thanks for talking with me oh thank you so much for having me i really appreciate it and everybody else thanks for tuning in to the lunchtime discovery series Again, thank you to the folks at the Office of Environmental Education for putting on the show. Thanks to the digital media staff at the museum for helping moderate the comments and for handling the live stream programming. Uh, the, again, this is a great partnership we have between our departments and divisions. We're so glad that we get to keep working together. Uh, that means that we will be back here next Wednesday at noon on the museum's YouTube channel with another Lunchtime Discovery series. Uh, follow North Carolina EE on Twitter or the hashtag lunchtime discovery to see what programs are coming up next and visit the website of the office of environmental education in order to uh, sign up for the newsletter. So you know what's coming up next and you can get more information about their events and programs uh, and the certification program too, that's going on there. And of course you can follow naturalsciences.org and there you can see all the virtual live events that are happening coming out of the museum and so much more. So, with that said, uh, one more round of applause for Jeremy for tuning in, for being here with us, and we'll see everybody again real soon. Bye, folks.